And, and honored this day as a father. And if you have your Bibles, if you'll find uh, Job chapter 1, and then also pick up Luke chapter 8. I was down there um, trying to sing and worship and trying to button my jacket, and it was I was struggling with that. Special thanks to Charles and Stacy for getting the raised donuts today. And... Uh, that wasn't the reason I was not able to button my jacket, though. I spent I've spent all weekend with teenagers at uh, Ridges Resort up in Hawassi, and uh, every time I looked down at the calorie count of the bag or the cup I was holding, it was like 200 calories or greater. And so I I, I was drinking a lemonade. I was just enjoying it, and I turned it around to the back side, and it said 220, the biggest number on the drink, 220. I was like. Good night. Two hundred and twenty calories in this in this lemonade, and and then and then to make it even more dismal for me, I looked on down at the sugar content, and it was like a hundred and thirteen percent sugar in that thing. I was like, "Holy cow! Who bought these unhealthy drinks for me and these teenagers to enjoy?" And uh, I just kept on drinking it. <laughs> you know, you know how we are sometimes. We're a glutton for punishment. And then, and then it reminded me when I got up here on the front row and I was worshiping with my wife and I looked over at her and I said, oh yeah, this, this is my jacket. It's got my name in it and I can't button it right now. But I, I mean, I can, but it's just not, it's, it's just a little tight. So um, if you'll pray with me while I preach this message that my jacket stays together, I don't know, maybe I'll just stay loose because I feel, I feel a little unction today. Um, it, it, listen, we had teen, we had we 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 didn't just have teenagers. We had we had from fourteen to twenty three year olds, and just so you'll know, we had a blast. Um, my muscles are telling me otherwise. You know, my my muscles are telling me I'm not fourteen to twenty three. My muscles and my body's telling me I'm fifty today. But we had a blast with the kids. If your kid went with us, thank you for letting them go. I think, as far as I know, everybody that went is coming back. And uh, so we praise the Lord for that. Um, those, there, there are some that are still up there. Um, we came back early because we wanted to spend uh, Father's Day in the Father's house with you. And uh, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be on Sunday than in God's house. Right here at Lakeland with you. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I don't, I don't aspire. Listen, I don't, have, uh, I don't have any other place that would call me to say, come preach for us that I'd rather be on Sunday than right here with you. That this this is this is where I'd rather be than anywhere. And today's Father's Day is a is a day we set aside to honor Father. Somebody said, uh, "Well, what about Daughter's Day?" And um, it, it, it's just been proven out that every day besides Father's Day and Mother's Day is Daughter's and Son's Day. Yeah, and so you you if you're a parent, you understand that the daughters and sons may not feel that sometimes, but. Since I'm a father today, it's, it's a good day for me. There are many men that the world regards as great. There's kings, there's political powers, those in authority that have kept peace or conquered territory. They're considered great military men. There's generals who 
have have been great leaders on the battlefields. They're considered to be great men. There's athletes, and listen, we put, let's just be honest, we put way too much emphasis and give way too much credence and respect to athletes who thrill spectators with their abilities and and who could who could who could who could not say that they're great in their professions? I mean, they're great. Um, Hollywood and all these other men. But this morning, I want us to think about the view from above. The, the world calls lots of men great. And that's great. But I want us to look at the view from above as to what God sees and what God thinks a great man is. And, and I, I wasn't even going to go to Job. I was looking at, at Luke chapter 8. And, and it's like I'm driving down from Hawassi this morning. It's like God just spoke into my heart, what about Job? And I was like, what about Job? And, and God said, you need to read Job 1, 1 through 5 again to the people and remember what kind of man Job was. And so I, I just want, to, I want us to look at these verses just as an introduction in, in the Old Testament, you know, so many people want to do away with the Old Testament because there's a New Testament, but I want to tell you there's great men in the Old Testament that ought to be honored and respected, just like there's great men in the New Testament that ought to be honored and respected. There was a man of the land of Uz whose name was Job, not to be confused with Job, which, by the way, I've never seen a day where there's more jobs available than today. So please, please do your best to not ever say you can't get a job because there's plenty out there to be had. Is that right? And so there was a man whose name was Job, and that man, notice, notice, church, that man was blameless and upright. Let's just be honest now. In the day that we're living, that those are still good qualities to have. Blameless and upright. And here's, here's the thing about Job, the character quality that all of us men ought to aspire to. One who feared God and shunned evil. You know what it means to shun evil? It means to like say, hey, stay away from me, evil. Not to not to embrace it, but to keep keep it away from you. Verse two, and Job, man, he had a he had a whale of a Father's Day every time it came around, didn't he? He had seven sons and three daughters. I mean, it was full house, right? It was more than eight's enough. Um, seven sons and three daughters born to him. And verse three says, and his possessions were seven thousand sheep. I mean, Job was a farmer. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys. Could you imagine that? A very large household. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And notice, notice what Job did here. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, that is, his kids, and he would rise early in the morning. Y'all to underline that and say, if you're going to get anything done for God, you need to do it early in the morning. Because I'm here to tell you, there are so many things that are going to pull you in so many different directions when everybody wakes up that you can't get nothing done for God if you don't get it done in the morning first. You better, you better get up early. Job got up early in the morning. And what did he do? He offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. How many kids did he have? Ten. So how many burnt offerings was Job offering every morning? Ten. Okay. This is the, this is the ultimate kind of father right here. Because notice what he said next. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Like, like possibly it could be that my, let, let's just be honest. Job didn't have to say it may be. Job could have said they have. Because we know Romans 3.23 says for all have what? And so we know, listen, as men, the ultimate sacrifice that we could have for our kids, the ultimate sacrifice we could make for our kids, the ultimate sacrifice we could make for our families is to rise up early and lay our hearts before the Lord and sacrifice our time and our love and show compassion to our family by saying, you know what, God, our kids have sinned before you and, and, and we, they, they have cursed God in their hearts. And notice what it says. This Job did how? Regularly. Like, like 
this was a this was a, a, a regular thing that he did. And so here's a man who was a was a great father in the Old Testament. And I, I read these verses to you today because if you just keep on going and reading that that Satan came to God and said, yeah, hey, have you considered your servant Job? And then the attacks began to come. What kind of attacks? It was, it was health attacks. He was attacked in his physical body. It, he was attacked. All of his kids did what? All of his kids did what? They died. Okay, get a grip on that for a minute. Think about your kids and how precious they are to you. And just imagine if all 10 of them died. And then, and then he lost all of his, he lost all of his cattle. He lost all of his livestock, right? And 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 then, and then it came down to it was just him and his wife left. And what did she tell him to do? She told him to curse God and die. Now, I'll be honest with you. I got to, I got to be honest with you. At this point in time, there has to be something within him to ask to say, you know what? That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad thought right now. But Job maintained his integrity. And said, woman, you speak like a foolish woman. And I want to tell you, we need some more men today that will rise up in this generation and say to those naysayers that say, you ought to just walk away from God and your faith. You ought, you ought to say to somebody, you speak like a foolish person. Because it's, it's, it's high time for people that believe in Jesus to stand up and be counted for him now more than ever. We need some great fathers that will stand up and proclaim the message of Christ no matter how rough life gets, and it's going to get rough. Somebody says, well, it's not too rough for me today, but it may get rougher down the road. And you got to just make up your mind, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the cost. Listen, P Peter said it to Jesus, to whom shall we go, Lord? You, you're the only one we can cling to in the good days and the bad days. So now you're in Luke chapter number eight. We're going to talk about... Another man who's considered great by God, probably nobody really hears about this man in the world today, men who have come to Christ, men who have been faithful to their wives, men who've been examples to their children, great men like Job. In the text today, we're going to talk about a man named Jarius. I think that's how you say his name, Jarius. What would qualify Jarius to be regarded as a great man and more than that a great father when well, luke in, in luke chapter 8 verse number 40 if you'll look at it with me it says so it was when jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him for they were all waiting for him and behold there came a man named jarius and he was a notice ruler of the synagogue and he did what church he fell down at jesus feet and begged him to come to his house so the first thing that makes jesus a man which i call a great father what is it that makes jarius a great father the first thing is jarius did the greatest thing a father can do so if you're writing notes if you take notes write that down jarius did the greatest thing a father can do what did he do in verse 41 it says that he came to Jesus. It might not seem like much, but it will make all the difference in a family when you come to Jesus. Much is made of deadbeat dads, of abusive fathers, and, and the like. And listen, I've been, I've been to my share of uh, prisons and jails and preached and, and preached to men who, who were incarcerated. You know, mo most of them, if you had a sit-down conversation with them, they're not guilty. But we all know that's not the case, okay? But 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 they're in there for something they did wrong, and and there's lots of men. There there there's lots of men that aren't with their families today because of something they've done wrong, and there's lots of families that are growing up today without a father. Lots of kids growing up without a father. There there's deadbeat dads who run off. There's there's abusive fathers who stay in the home and abuse their families. The greatest abuse a man can do, in my opinion, in life, is to fail. To lead his family spiritually it's, it's, it's to be the provider and, and and most men have this mentality if i provide for you if i make a living for you i mean they think that the buck stops with this as long as i keep my job and keep supporting the family with my money 
my, my paycheck coming home, that you just need to leave me alone, let me do my sports and activities, let me have my hobbies and just let me go do my stuff. And you, you know, the woman's place is in the home and, um, and I'm gonna just go get the job and, 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 and do, do what I need to do outside the home. But, but to me, the greatest abuse a man can do to his family is to not have a spiritual aspect in the home. You may not be all you need to be as a dad this morning, but when you come to Jesus and you continually come back, remember what Job did. He did this. What was that word? It starts with an R. It's the kind of gas you put in your car. Regular. Okay. Think about this. Every time you go to put gas in your car, I need to be regularly coming to Jesus. Right. Um, and then just, just think of, think of the results is the premium gas. Right. Uh, when you come to Jesus regularly, he's going to make your life premium. I don't even know why I got off on the gas. I mean, how, how do you get off on gas? I mean, maybe that, maybe somebody needed that. I don't know. But here, here's the thing. As you allow Jesus to change your life, he's going to turn. He's going to turn not, not just in your life. He's going to turn in your family's life, and he's going to make changes in your family's life. Who was this Jarius anyway? The Bible tells us he was a real religious man. He was a ruler of the synagogue, the Bible says. He was a ruler of the synagogue. He was a respected leader in his community among his people. But that wasn't enough. He would, he would be like a, a preacher in a church today. But you know, that's not enough. He recognized his deficiencies. And I want to tell you, as men, as macho as you are, I mean, you could drop down and give me 50 right now, okay? Uh, maybe you couldn't. Maybe you could just give me 10. But, but, but if you, I mean, as macho as you are, as strong as you are, as much as you think you have and what you can do on your own, I want to tell you there's deficiencies in all of our lives without Jesus Christ. This man recognized his deficiencies. Religion, uh, he was a religious man, but religion is of man. It's not of God. Religion will send a man or send a person to hell and he will take his entire family with him. This man knew that religion was not enough. Being a preacher is not enough. What brought Jarius to Jesus? It was a crisis in the home. By show of hands, anybody ever experienced a crisis in the home? By show of hands. Come on, just, just hold them up high. I'd say everybody's experienced a crisis in the home. Everybody's experienced a crisis in the home. In his case, his daughter was dying. It was something he couldn't handle. His religion didn't offer him any relief. He came to Jesus, and notice how he came to Jesus. He fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. He fell down to Jesus' feet. What is the picture when somebody comes to Jesus and falls down at their feet? What is that picture? What does that give a representation of? humility. He came to Jesus humbly, which is the way we ought to always approach Jesus. He came to Jesus humbly, and his desire was, I need help. Can anybody identify with that? Is anybody in that kind of crisis situation or ever been in that crisis situation? He begged Jesus to come to his house. The greatest thing I want to say a father can do for his family is invite Jesus into his home. Courtney and I built our house 28 years ago, and when we were building that house, I was young enough in my faith and, and, and just trusting in God enough to know that his presence would go everywhere I go, and I wanted to be everywhere I was. And even as a young believer, a young preacher, I was walking through that house, didn't know much at all about building, but I had a good contractor that's building that house for us. And I was saying, Lord, I need you in every room of this house. And can I tell you, 28 years later, the same thing applies. I need the Lord to fill his, his, every room of my house with his presence. I need him now more than I did then. I just thought I needed him then. I need him now more than ever. We all do. We, we, need, we need to invite Jesus to come into our homes. What will it take? Here, here's something you need to write in your notes right now. What will it take? Ask yourself this question. What will it take to bring you to Jesus? What's it going to take? I mean, how far has it got to go? How bad does it have to get? What, what kind of crisis is it going to take? I remember um, I, I wasn't going to even share any kind of personal illustrations or anything like that because 
Sometimes I feel like I've been preaching to y'all, some of y'all 15 years, you've heard all the stories, you've heard all, I can't even tell a joke. They were making fun of me at the teen camp uh, this weekend about reading jokes even and messing them up. I mean, that's just, you know, I do know this though. I can't tell a joke and I'm not, I'm not all that, but I do know this, God called me. I still know that after, after all these years, God called me. And I, I, I wasn't where I ought to be. Do you, under, do you understand what I mean? I wasn't where I ought to be in my walk with Christ. And I was working night shift at Zua up there by West Hall High School. And, and Courtney was staying, you know, I, I got a security system so she would feel safe at the house. I think one of the things that, um, you know, a, a husband ought to provide for his family is security as a protector of the home. And, and I wasn't able to be there every night. And I, I provided the security system for her to feel more comfortable. And this night she was spending the night at her parents' house because she was not feeling real comfortable staying alone alone. And, and I was at work and, you know, at work, you just, you feel like, you know, you, you've done the same thing over and over and over and you know what you're doing. And you get this mindset sometimes that everything is just this way. And, you know, you know how to do it all. And it's just, and, and we do this repetitious thing. We're building power steering pumps and I'm out there at the bracket assembly. We put brackets on them. We put them in a box. We label the boxes. We stack them on pallets. They come get the pallets and take them off and they're going on, you know, foreign cars around the world, right? So you may be driving a car today with a power steering pump that your pastor put together. Right? Good luck with that. And, uh, and, and this particular, this particular night in the middle of the night, I'm cutting these boxes open and the boxes are reinforced on the corners with, with double cardboard. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm real slick and I'm real, you know, I'm macho. So I, and I'm ambidextrous, right? Okay. So, so I'm going to cut both sides. I'm going to cut two sides with my left hand and change the box cut around and cut two sides with my right hand. And I had put a fresh blade in there. And I went to cut with my right hand. How many of you know this? If you're left-handed, you can't hardly do nothing with your right hand. I mean, I can barely raise my right hand right now. Like, I don't want to eat with my right hand. I don't brush my teeth. My, I certainly don't need to be using a, a, a razor right-handed. When I cut through that box, that razor came out of that box and went into my arm all the way. And it left about a, it left about a three-inch, four-inch incision that I've still got right here on my arm right here and it's straight up and down and when it cut in it went all the way in and it it it, it was I mean it was like a fountain of blood coming out and the, the guy that was working next to me reacted faster than I can think I'm ble I'm bleeding he had already wrapped my arm with this real strong industrial towel and threw it up in the air above my head and I was like where'd you come from I'm already losing consciousness because I've already lost that much blood and they don't even wait. Like the, the protocol at the workplace was supposed to be, you know, you call 911 or 911. I always get that wrong. 911 and um, you, you, you call 911 and the, the, the paramedics come and get you and you ride in the vehicle. They take me out there and put me in this roughed up pickup truck. And it's raining like three sheets into the wind, kind of rain. And they're, ru they're, they're running the windshield wipers on fast. And we're going up the McEver Road. And I'm thinking, dear God, am I going to die in this truck? And I can't get a hold of my wife. And they're holding my arm. And the Holy Spirit's saying to me, when are you going to get close to me? What's it going to take for you to sell out to me? And I'm just thinking, I'm just worried about my arm right now. And then I get to the, I get to the emergency room and they, and they, and they, they try to, you know, they, they want to go through all this, what's your name and address and phone number. And I'm over there, they're having to do this smelling sauce to keep me awake. Cause I'm, I'm, the guy is, the guy is sewing me up on the table. And he said, you barely missed the main artery that would have took your life. I'm talking, he said, I'm talking, he said, you barely missed it. And he said, as a matter of fact, all these people that try to commit suicide or say they're committing suicide and they cut this way, he said, that's really nothing more than an attention getter because you can't hardly cut through all of those 
uh, tendons in there to get down to that main artery. But he said, the way you cut was exactly like you're supposed to cut. And I said, sir, I, I promise you, I wasn't trying to kill myself. And he's sewing me up saying, you, you almost took your own life. And after I got sewed up, I got in the car. And, of course, they let me have the rest of the night off, praise God. But as I was going home, as I was going home, the Holy Spirit was going with me saying, this is a constant reminder to you now that you need to stick close to me. And it's always there. It's a constant reminder to me. And listen, what, what I'm asking you today is to think about this question. What will it take to bring you to Jesus? What's it going to take to bring you to Jesus? Jarius did the greatest thing a father could do. He came to Jesus because of his crisis. Number two, write this down. Jarius demonstrated the greatest example of a father's love. He came to talk to Jesus about his child. I've seen some of the toughest, strongest men I've ever known break down and cry like babies over their children. I mean, you, you think they would never cry, but they'll break down and cry over their children. Young, uh, uh, men, men who have daughters must have an idea or an understanding or a mindset. If you've got a daughter, you can imagine what this man is going through. Those little girls who look up to their daddy and believe that he can do anything in the world. If it's broke, he can fix it. If it's messed up, he can straighten it out. The most privileged children in the world. Now, I want you to stand here and just, or sit here and just think with me for a minute about being privileged. Um, we, we got a lot of people talking today about being privileged and about, especially about being white privileged and being apologetic for being white. I, I tell you, I don't think anybody ought to apologize for the way they were created. You were born, you were created by God in his image. Whatever color you are, you should not apologize for that. The most privileged children in the world, though, I want you to think about this, are the, are the, are the children whose parents, they have parents who will pray for them. If you're a child today, if you're a child today and you're sitting here and you're 50 years old and you're a child, if you've got parents that have prayed for you, you're a privileged child. You ought not to take back. You ought not to apologize for that. You ought not to say, I'm sorry, my parents prayed for me. You ought to thank God for that. It, it, today, you're a privileged child if you have parents who care about what happens to you. I'm not talking about parents who are just, just flippant about what their kids do and just let them go out there and try anything and everything, but who really care. I really care about what happens to my kids. Like, I, I believe this was Job's heart when Job was sacrificing before God because we read what was the reason why Job brought those sacrifices before God every day because his his sons and daughters could have what sinned and I really believe this that parents who care about their kids and the lifestyle that they live if it's sinful and they care so much that they go before the Lord on behalf of their kids like like my kids are cursing God in their hearts and I care enough not to curse them, but to come to God and ask for forgiveness for them. This is, this is the type of dad Job was to his kids. Parents who care about what happens to their kids. Parents who will love and discipline their kids in accordance with God's word. Don't we need more men today that will stand up and say the Bible is still the word of God and we're still going to honor God and his word? Those are privileged children. Jairus was willing to put aside all of his known all, all of his own selfish pride and come to Christ on behalf of his little girl. Last of all, the last point I want to make is this. Jarius faced the greatest test of a father's faith. Let's read beginning in verse 49 because as they went, as Jarius came to Jesus and fell at his feet and begged Jesus to come to his house, they went that way, and as they went that way, Jesus met another woman that had an issue of blood, and she'd been to all the doctors. I'm, I'm going to tell you, you can go to all the doctors, and sometimes they just can't fix it. But then she met Jesus, and he took care of the problem. As, as, 
as Jesus is going on the way to Jairus' house, he met this woman, and, and then after 48, we find 49, and Jesus is still speaking. Uh, one, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, you can imagine now Jesus is on his way to the house. Today, you know, you'd probably get a text message, but, but then the, the man was running down from the house to tell him, hey, notice your daughter is what? Dead, do not trouble the teacher. Verse 50 says, but when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only what? Believe, and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John. These are the inner three of the disciples, the 12 disciples, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but Jesus said, do not weep. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. It's amazing how God views things different from the way we view things. Verse 53, and they ridiculed him knowing that she was dead, but he put them all outside. Took her by the hand. Why, you say, why did he put her all, why, why did he put them all outside? I think he came to the place where he realized, hey, you faithless people got to go. Because we know this, the Bible says in Hebrews 11 that faith pleases God. And so our lack of faith is displeasing to God. You want to know how you can please God is to have faith in him, that he can do something different, that he can do something supernatural. And so he puts them out and, and he puts them outside. He takes her by the hand and he calls saying, little girl, what? Arise. And then her spirit returned and she uh, arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were, what church? They were astonished. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Jarius faced the greatest test of a father's faith here in this text. You know what he had to do? He had to wait on God. You know the greatest test that we face today is waiting on God and his timing. Before Jesus responded to his request, another, another person in need had reached out to Christ. Can you picture what happens? Another person took Jesus' attention. It was the woman of the issue of blood. And, and as Jesus dealt with this woman's need, Jarius had to wait. And, and listen, sometimes you have to wait because God's dealing with, uh, you know, God's a multitasker, though. Aren't you glad for that? Like everybody in the room can be praying at the same time for their kids, and God can hear all those prayers at the same time. But you know, the need to wait is, is necessary for us because our, 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 our waiting provides perseverance and it provides character in our lives that says, you know what? We're going to believe God, whether it takes a day or takes 10 years. We're not going anywhere. God wants to see what your faith's all about. Some of you have faith for a day. I tell you, God, if you'll move today, I'll do something for you today. That isn't how it works. The Christian faith is, listen, you come to Jesus and leave it there, and you keep serving, right? Though, though he slay me, Job, Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And here's the thing. Um, most of us do not wait well. Especially you CDOs, comp comp compulsive what is that? Com obsessive OCD. O yeah, OCDs. I'm doing it for Courtney now, CDOs. Um, Courtney's CDO. She's not OCD. She's in alphabetical order. CDO. She couldn't have it out of order. I say, Courtney, you're just OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. She said, I don't like that. Oh, CDO. I forgot. You got to have it in alphabetical order. Most of us do not wait well. How many of you don't wait well? Be honest. I mean, you know, do you know you time out something silly like a red light? You time it out, though, it's only like a couple of minutes, but it seems like an eternity when you're in a hurry. The Lord knows what he's doing. He had to wait on God, but it seemed like he had waited too long. While observing the conversation between Jesus and the woman, he must have been encouraged. He was privilege to observe the miracle of the healing the exact thing that he desired but then he gets this horrible news the, the 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 
one of his one of his servants comes with this news your daughter is dead she was just sick before i mean i i brought myself to you i fell down before you i came like you wanted me to i'm humble and my daughter's sick and i need something and my daughter's dead now gee thanks lord and I'm afraid Christianity has, has suffered such a hard blow from this mindset. I came to you, Lord, and you, di- you, you, like, like you disappointed me. Like, wait a minute, back the truck up for a minute. Let's think about this for a second. If Jesus didn't go to the cross, we'd all be in a mess. So because he went to the cross, nobody should be disappointed with Jesus. So everything else ought to be like looking at it like a bonus. But here's our mindset and here's, here's our mentality. And if we're not careful, we get, so, we get so angry with God because he doesn't treat us like we ought to be treated. We, we get the, here's, here's, here's where we get. We get to be like the prodigal son's brother and say, I've done all this stuff for you, Lord, but you hadn't done me anything but wrong. Because the first thing when my brother comes home, you want to make a party for him, but you don't have a party for me. And we forget this whole time that God's been good to us. I want to tell you again, in case you forgot, God's been good to you. I want to speak it into your heart again because some of you still don't believe it. God has been really good to you. He's been really good to me. The daughter's dead. Your daughter's dead. What do you think went through his mind? Grieving over the loss of his little girl, anger over the interruption of this woman, and regret that he didn't come to Jesus sooner. Maybe angry that Jesus didn't drop this woman and come to him first. I mean, you gotta you gotta act now for me, God. I need you to act now. But before he could act on any of those emotions, Jesus spoke wonderful words of encouragement. He said, to, he said to the man, fear not, believe. Just believe. How could Jarius have faith? Everything he counted dear to him was gone. His little girl was dead. By the way, it was his only daughter. It wasn't like Job. Job had 10, but Job lost all 10 of his at the same time too. It was his only daughter. His little girl was dead. Jesus is willing to tell him to believe. Faith is believing when it seems totally impossible to believe. His faith turned into reality as he and his wife watched as the Savior took their little girl by the hand and brought her back from death to life. That's what God's wanting to do in our situations. Jesus did what Jesus does best. He's a giver of life. Cameron, you can come. Romans 3.23 is a doom verse. I mean, for, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Romans 6.23 declares the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, whether you, whether you want to receive it or not, if you're a believer, he's breathed life into you. Eternal life is only available through Jesus Christ. As we look at this great father named Jarius, it was, he was great because he did the greatest thing a father could do. He came to Jesus. I want to ask you today, will you come to Jesus? One of the greatest quotes I've seen this week on Facebook is this. We need to turn the church stage into the church altar again. Let that sink in for a minute because this is not America's Got Talent right here. This is not American Idol. Thank God. Hey, thank God that they're up here singing and not me. I mean, you know, you, you want to come up here and sing with him? Come try. Talk to Cameron. But I'm just going to tell you, me and Cameron's had conversations. He's not going to let me up here, and I'm not wanting to get up here because he don't want me to make a fool of myself before I ever get up to preach. Some people only come to hear me one time, and it may be because they think I can't preach. I don't know. I've scratched my head. I've tried to figure out what keeps them coming back. I mean, if I could give them a cup of coffee every Sunday to keep them coming back, would I do it? I don't know. Maybe, but I'm going to be honest with you. We need to turn the church stage into to an altar again. 
You know why? Because our hearts need to be altered. They don't need to be lifted up with pride. We don't need any more pride in America. Thank God for American-made, and if you buy only American-made, thank God for you to buy American-made. God bless you. We don't need any more pride in America. We need humility. We need people to run to Jesus again. If you've got kids, I'm talking right now, you need to bring your kids to Jesus. You need to run to this altar. I'm asking you today, will you come to Jesus Christ today? Will you love your children enough to intercede on their behalf? Do you love your kids? If you really love your kids, don't tell me you're going to give them everything they want and tell me you love them. You love your kids by showing them that you love them by interceding for them. We love our kids and we don't give them everything they want. We love our kids and we've been really good to them, haven't we? We've been really good to them. But you know what they need more than what they want? They need Jesus. Will your faith stand the test that a crisis will bring? I'm telling you, I keep saying this, and, you know, people say, oh, y'all not to say this, preacher, it's negative. It's not negative, it's just real. If the, if the Lord tears is coming, we're going through tougher days. Courtney and I had a couple of days at Dollywood together, and we went down to the lightning rod. They tell me, we're standing in line, you know, and they're telling me, this thing starts out 47 miles an hour in 2.2 seconds. And then it goes 73 miles an hour, and I'm like, dear God, my heart rate's over 100 already, and I ain't even got, I'm just standing in line for the thing. I got a 60-minute wait on this. How am I ever going to make it through this ride? And then, I, and then I'm thinking, we're idiots. We, we paid to do this. I mean, we paid for this torture. You know, like, I could have just stayed home, you know, and, and I paid for this. Like, Courtney said, we're celebrating 50 all year long. We got a, a season pass to Dollywood. Happy, every time we go, she said, happy 50th birthday. I'm thinking, she's trying to kill me. She's trying to kill me. I didn't realize it, Charles. She's trying to kill me on my 50th. At an amusement park, too, of all places. That ain't very funny. I don't think y'all not be y'all not to be laughing. And we're standing there in line and we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting and the anticipation's building, it's building, it's building. And we get on the ride. Aren't you glad they don't just say, sit down, shut up, and hold on? They strap you in. Series always wanting to be part of the sermon. They strap you in. Listen, they strap you in. I'm talking about on that ride, they pull this thing down over you, and it goes over. How many of you wrote it? How many of you wrote it? Raise your hand. Just three, four, or five people. God bless you. The rest of you, you, you need to live a little. You need to get on the wild side. Um, they strap you in. That harness comes over you, and and it comes down around your head. And I mean, when you're on the thing, you know, it's slinging you back and forth and you're slamming up. You know, it's no time to think about germs and stuff because everybody's face has been up against those, those things that you're up against, you know. And, but, but the whole time you're doing that, you know, it's slinging you around and stuff. I mean, you better make sure you're buckled in because you're on the ride. You're on a ride of your life, like 47 miles an hour. You go up that first hill, phew, it's like riding in a car with Tony. You just fly right up the hill. You know, it's no, it's no, nothing slow about it. It's just straight up 2.2 seconds. I'm like, whoa, and then 73 miles an hour. I'm telling you, this world, this world's going to give you the ride of your life. And you can, listen, you can go to a doctor and get a prescription that'll help you get through it. You can, you can, you can go through all kinds of relationships that say they're going to satisfy you and meet your needs and you find out that's not going to help. I mean, you, you, like this woman, this woman tried all these doctors and she couldn't get any help. I'm going to tell you, Dr. Jesus is not the last resort He's the first resort. He's the first place we need to go. So I'm going to ask you again, as we stand our feet,
Here's the invitation. If you're watching online, here's the invitation. Come to Jesus today and place your faith in Christ. Come today and surrender to be what God would have you to be. Don't wait till you have to cut yourself. Don't wait till you have to cut yourself and the Lord speak to you in the middle of the night and say, hey, you better straighten up and live right. Could have been over. Come today and believe his word. Take him at his word. And I'm going to ask you last of all, if you got your family here, this is not a stage. This is an altar. And I'm inviting you today to leave your seat with your family right now and bring them to this altar like Job would. What would Job do if he was here today? He would bring his kids to the altar. Whether they were here in person or not, he'd bring his kids to the altar. And he'd say, it might be that my kids have cursed God in their hearts. And so, Lord, I'm bringing them to the altar. And I'm asking you to work a miracle in their life. As you come, as you bring your kids, you want to be a great dad. Intercessory prayer is one of those things that builds a great, great dad. And I encourage you, don't give up on your family. You may not be a dad that the world would write about it, but you may be a dad that God's going to look down and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, we boldly come to the throne of grace today. We declare your throne room, our spiritual hotline. God, we need you. Lord, now more than we ever have before, we're in crisis mode. It may be one of our own making, Lord. It may be something that we have done ourselves to put us in this crisis mode. It, it certainly is something we've done as a country, Lord. We've We've turned our back on you, and Lord, we're, we're in desperate need of the life that only you can give and breathe into this country and breathe into the hearts of your people especially. But Lord, there's people around us in this community and in this nation that need Jesus. And Lord, we just pray, God, that you would bring life back to those people that are dead right now. We know people that are dead in trespasses and sin. Lord, we know that you can give eternal life today. So, Lord, we humbly bow at your feet. We humbly bow in consideration of our kids who no doubt have sinned and failed you, cursed God in their hearts. Lord, we come on their behalf. We bring the sacrifice asking for forgiveness for them. Lord, asking for forgiveness for ourselves, Lord, as we deliberately and willfully sin without regard to the price that was paid or the debt that we owe. Lord, we pray, God, that you would have mercy on us. We pray, God, that you would fill us with your spirit to be overcomers, to fight back against the sin and to push back as Job did to shun the evil, to say, no, God, give us, 
Give us the power to say no. It's so easy to take in or consume the wrong things, and it's so easy to let our eyes see the wrong things or our ears hear the wrong things or our mouth to say the wrong things and our heart to be engrossed in the wrong things. God, help us to, to shun that evil and say no to it. God, we humbly request that you breathe life into us, to our families, to our kids. God, our burden for this next generation. And Lord, we know you've promised. We know that you promised a seed. We know you promised your truth would endure to every generation. We know that, that you promised there would be a, a seed of righteous people in every generation. And God, I thank you for that. And I believe in that. And I'm praying, God, that our families would represent those believers in the next generations to follow. I pray for these kids. I pray for their kids. I pray for the grandkids. God, that you administer grace, that you would help us to be the kind of examples that we need to be, the kind of examples as dads and moms, Lord, that would do the right thing, though the world doesn't even acknowledge who we are or know who we are. Lord, I'm thankful that in heaven, we're bringing glory and honor to the name above all names because we're living for you, Lord. Lord, help us to live for you, help us to serve you, and help us to be willing to die for you, for your cause. Lord, we praise you for these people in this altar. We pray for great things to happen in their lives and their families' lives. We pray for those online that you administer grace to them as well. And we thank you most of all for being a great father to us through all that we go through. Thank you for hearing and answering prayer today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.